Yes, my, my name is Piani. Thank you for saying my name as it's supposed to be. I've had very different versions of it, Fiani, Paiani, um, mostly P works. <laughs> yes, I, I, I was born in, in Limpopo in the 70s. I think it was Transvaal then, um, in a village, just, just about 18 kilometers outside Guiani. We always farmed, so my f father farms now. Yes, he still calls me to come home and fix a pump, whatever needs to be done. Oh, vaccinate too. So you have to run after these animals and do whatever it is that needs to be done. But, but the, the short story is, growing up, I think uh, my, my grandfather uh, was very light too. This is where this comes from. And uh, he, he, he could speak a little bit of English, and a bit of Africans. He is he is a was died around 63, 64 age. Um, this means that every time, especially around December, um, people would come to our village for buying animals uh, for their Christmas and whatever. Usually if the client is a white man, there is a bit of money. Um, if it's a black guy, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. <laughs> so my grandfather, being the one who speaks a bit of white people's languages, if you call it that, I don't think he was that good, but he did. So they would call him, and he'll converse with this gentleman. And of course, if the gentleman had good money, he would be coming to our crawl to buy. If the money wasn't enough, then we would find a volunteer <laughs> for, 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 the, for the cattle to be bought. Oh, he had a good head, over 300 uh, in those days. These were the 80s. That was a lot of cattle. I think even today it's a lot of cattle. Um, w w where am I going with this? If you are not on the table, somebody is going to eat your lunch. It is as easy as that. So somebody uh, has to make sure that they are there and they are able to do that. Now, I've got to figure this. Which, which button, please? The green one. Oh, the, yes, there we go. Thank you. Um, in the middle there, you can see the map of Africa. Apparently, by 2030, there will be about 1.4 billion of us. Oh, others estimate about 1.5 billion. And by 2050, there will be double that number or close to that. And uh, about 60 percent, or at least 55 by some estimate, by 2030, most of those people will be in the urban areas. Um, if you look at that, I've put some red dots there. Um, those are the three countries in this continent that export their livestock commodities, and the rest of the continent doesn't. Um, if they do, it's illegal. <laughs> they, they shouldn't be. <laughs> What's the problem? Why can't they, they, they export? Uh, part of it is that um, there is the World Health Organization, which does a very good job of making sure that diseases within animals, you'd know that over 60% of human disease, infectious ones, were once only animal diseases. So they jump the species line and become human diseases. COVID has taught us one or two things. Um, it means that it controls um, how do we make sure that we do not spread disease from one part of the world to another. And for most of the continent, we are unable to put down that science and the management and the control so that we can say, these animals that we have, what diseases do they have? How are we treating them? Are they clean of that disease? Then we are allowed to export them. It's as easy as that. And it's not happening. Now, if you're going to have about 1.5 billion people by 2030, and already we have enough trouble that people are crossing the Mediterranean to our friends in the north, 
it's not very successful as you've seen. There needs to be food, um, not just for ourselves, but to feed also the friends in the north. I think you have seen what the Middle East looks like. You know the numbers in Asia, they need food too. Um, the North and South America, it means we have to do something. If you look at Botswana, Namibia and South Africa, that's where the red dots are. We have about, give or take, 30 million cows. Maybe same number of uh, goats and sheep. And if you look at Ethiopia alone, 110 million cows. Not a single one is being exported. South Sudan, small country, lots of skirmishes here and there. They still have almost 18 million cows. So in short, where I grew up, um, everybody in my village, if you are well off, you had some cows. If you are middle class by my village standard, you had a goat. And if you are poor, you had at least a chicken. <laughs> Because if a visitor comes, you have to run around, grab that thing, and at least have some decent meal. Otherwise, people will look at you in a very bad way. Now, Africa in its own, uh, the bulk of the GDP itself is based on agriculture. The same as the people in my village. You fly anywhere in the continent, they are planting something, whether it's cassava in the central and West Africa, or it's Matoke in East Africa and Central, or it's Milis in Southern Africa. We do, and we've been planting those things for time immemorial. When it comes to animals, we grow them with the disease, with everything. Sometimes people will say, oh no, these people don't know how to farm. It's not true. It is not true. There is nobody who would still have animals in this point in time given the lack of technology, the lack of understanding, the lack of overgrazing and everything, and people still have their animals. The only time you see, oh, we might have a problem with famine in Ethiopia or Somalia or this and that, is when we have drought. Meaning when there's no drought, people do the best that they can to grow the things that they have to get it right. Now, why am I talking to you about that? The animals you see on the screen are all from the African continent, uh, including South Africa for the sheep, but the rest of them are in the African continent. Um, I've, I've missed a slide. I don't know how to go back. There we go. Now, what do we do? We have the commodity. That's animals. We farm. We grow them. We do not export them. We eat them. That's not good enough. Mostly the exported animal within South Africa, um, if you buy or sell around, could be about 10, 12,000 rand. If you export and the amounts you get from there, it's on the upside of 24,000 rand, meaning that comes in foreign direct income. You can pay some customs, you can pay some taxes and whatever, and that's how we run the country. Now, that should be extrapolated to the whole continent. We should be able to feed ourselves. Put in the climate change, and where you used to have rain, now you have drought. Where it was dry, now it's raining, and everything else. Is the, is the new soil fertile? Uh, should we, what should we be doing? So it, it helps us in two ways. We can look at diseases as a company. Uh, you can see on the pictures, that's myself. I looked a little younger there. Um, that's in Lesotho, we're looking after FMD, uh, and during the time we find there is actually anthrax. Lesotho, every time there's anthrax, they try and get the animal, uh, kill it, they dig, they put it in, you must put lime so that they can decompose, then you cover up, and that way you'll have less of these spores coming up and making people and animals sick. But uh, Lesotho is mountainous. So people dig as much as they can. Instead of two meters, they end up with one meter. Put the cow, put lime. Three years later, spores comes up. We have the same problem. Um, yeah, it's, it's easy to talk about Lesotho like it's another country until there's a problem there and everybody's in Joburg, Jen. 
and we have to deal with it. <laughs> Meaning we have to go in there, innovate, do the things that needs to be done for their benefit, for our benefit. By the way, their more hair and their sheep is one of the best in the world. And that is part of the things that we should be doing. So you, you can see that as part of what we do to innovate, we develop the processes and the biotechnology to say, where we can find it off the shelf, let's bring it, let's use it. Where it's not available, why is it not available? Let's develop it, let's use it, and let's get on with it. So that we can make sure that the animals within this continent gain that value that we require so that our people, our parents, and by the way, animals are mostly in the rural areas. So as people leave the rural areas and they go to the cities, we should make sure that there is some sort of economy within those villages that assist with the cities and also assist with the people that are left in the villages. And some of us were able to go through university um, uh, based on that. And therefore it becomes critical and imperative that one does not only look at it in terms of agriculture, but what is the contribution to the GDP of your country or the countries that you are assisting? What is the food security element that you are bringing in? What is the viruses and bacteria that are there and you need to be able to treat those animals before that becomes a human issue? And, and, and that's part of a, a continuum that one needs to, to work out. And unfortunately, working with animals is not a glamorous work. Uh, they are usually in the bushes, so you have to go there. You have to chase around these things, uh, get the, 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 the medication they need. Um, you have to also assess just the general health. Uh, you cannot just go there, take blood samples, and go back to the lab. You have to look at the ticks. You have to look at the skin. You have to look at whatever else is the problem to an extent that when we run around those bushes, the people in those uh, areas uh, get very happy because they know their animals will get some treatment. We're not just taking samples and going away. Um, but standards at the same time are very important. There's no way that you will run around South Africa or cross over to Zimbabwe or, 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 or Zambia. Um, and the picture you see there is in Rwanda. Um, and you are going to say, we have looked at the disease and we are able to get away with this. You can't. You have to do it at the same standard that the Europeans are doing, the North Americans are doing, and make sure that we are able to do this. Where is our best part? We don't have to worry because uh, we already have the commodity. That is the animals. Our people farm anyway. So how do we make sure that uh, this is done properly? Um, I have a group of young, enthusiastic people um, that, that I'm able to run around with. Uh, we look at the development, uh, the production of uh, uh, products that we are able to use towards uh, uh, disease detection. Now, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, a few years ago, while I was running around the continent, we found uh, an avian influenza strain. At the time, it was around uh, DRC um, in the eastern side of it. And uh, we sat there. I was still working at the CSR at the, moment, at the time. And came back and said, we have a strain of flu that uh, seems to be problematic. Uh, this regulation and stuff, you cannot just uh, cross over to DRC, take a sample and bring it back to South Africa. You have to apply to Ministry of Agriculture. There's issues about uh, non-proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destruction, because all these viruses you can be used in one way or the other, which is great, by the way. But it means that you go slow in what you need to do. It would be very easy to go to Kisangani, set up a lab, and quickly look at this virus, and only the parts that are not dangerous bring them back to do your sequencing and other things that you need to do. But such doesn't go hand in hand. And eventually it was in Lusaka, it was in Zimbabwe, it was in Limpopo, 
It was so sad. I could sit there and show you the flow of the same exact virus wave going down to Cape Town and a little bit back to KZN, and that's where it disappeared. Similar to what we've seen with uh, COVID. And then the question becomes, what, what happens in the future? Is this how it's supposed to go? It starts here, it goes all the way back, and we publish a nice paper. No, <laughs> there should be more that can be done uh, on that. We need to have that strategic depth where you are able to say, I see this in Sudan. Uh, this happened uh, early this year. Rift Valley fever in Sudan, down to South Sudan. Uganda into Rwanda, I think now it's almost in Tanzania. Um, how long before Limpopo all the way down we suffer through that? It's not that it shouldn't happen. We should be able to say, do we have a way to detect it? Do we have a vaccine to protect ourselves? And are we able to keep our commodities and our farmers farming the way they need to farm and keep going? Can we clone that and reproduce it in other countries? Because then you're exporting that South African technology into regions that really, really need it. And once you have that as a continent, you're going a lot far than uh, a lot of us would think it's possible to go. And, and, and in short, my, my topic and the discussion is that we have to look at it in a global way, and we have to make sure that the little bit that we have, we lead on it. If we don't, we'll be forced to, because the population is growing. The number of resources we have is nowhere near what we need. But to do the rest of the things that we need to, we at least at a minimum have to eat. And that is the message that I would like to leave everybody with. I'd like to thank everybody on there and my team Beyond Bio, which I forgot to put on, but I think they'll understand. Thank you. Thank you.